Who's just firing the rifles off? Yeah, particularly loud and all out of box powder. As you can see, he's able to kneel down, load his weapon, and fire it off. And even down here. So wherever you're standing, uh, the, unlike it, it's not a square. There's not a single wall facing down on you. It's at least three or four different angles where you could be shot at. Uh, you know, quite the um, challenge. Uh, so the idea was if you're attacking Halifax, uh, the first thing you'd have to do is get to Halifax. And in order to do that, you'd have to sail your soldiers from wherever you're attacking uh, up the coast to Halifax. In order to do that, you'd have to defeat whatever presence the Royal Navy had, whatever ships they had. I'll stand here so I look in the sun and no one else has to. So, that being said, so if you arrived in Halifax um, and landed your men, you weren't able just to sail your ship down the harbor, that you, you know, which would be natural. So what the British had done was put forts at the mouth of the harbor and on the two islands inside the harbor. So when you go to your cruise ship and you're leaving Halifax Harbor today, you'll notice that there's forts uh, all around the city as uh, you enter the harbor. So what you'd have to do is land your men outside the harbor, march them around behind the citadel, and then siege the fort. So stop everything from coming in and out of the city, and more importantly, in and out of the citadel. Once you could do that, once you had your men in place and had your guns in place, you'd start digging a ditch <laughs> up the side of the hill. The whole time you'd be under fire. Now it's a tradition in British towns to have a common land. So this is, these are fields where you can graze your cattle. Halifax has what they call the commons, and it's on the western side of the citadel, so behind us. Uh, the harbor and the city, uh, the main um, tourism areas, are on that side, in the, you know, where you came in. The common land was placed where it is today because it's a clean, clear killing field. There's no, uh, no trees, there's no brush to hide behind, so it would make it very difficult for an advancing army to attack you. Now, once you got to the side of the citadel, zigzagged your way up through ditches, through tunnels, then you'd finally have the main attack, the main assault. So the men would come running up the side of the hill, what was left of it, and then you'd land in here. If you didn't break a leg or twist an ankle, you'd find yourself standing where we are right now. Now, you'll notice this structure right here. There's a tr uh, tunnel, uh, excuse me, there's a moat that runs all the way around it as well. And there's three of these. And the idea of this bastion is that if you can hold this, great, but if it gets captured, the enemy still doesn't have the main port. All they have is a small piece of the citadel itself. And all the cannons as part of this can't actually be turned around. So when they knew the attack was gonna come, they put men in here and load it with ammunition. And you can see there's little slits in the outer wall. That actually runs all the way around as well. So once again, when you're standing here, not only can you be shot from up there and up there, but also through the walls there. You'll notice the bigger uh, openings in the walls and those actually lead into uh, rooms within the citadel. And those uh, holes there in the wall are big enough to run cannons out and fire. But they wouldn't fire a cannonball. What they'd fire is what's called grape shot. So smaller pieces of metal, shrapnel if you will, straight down, like a bowling alley. So if you're standing here, you, you pretty much can hit anything uh, from inside. And as you can see, it would have been a mighty tall order to climb that wall uh, back up. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the questions you always get are what are those masks and why are they there? Um, the tall one is a common courtesy of the British Army at this time period, and it hoists different flags of different merchant ships. So Canard Lines, for example, has its own flag. So when the Queen Mary II was in town a few years ago, we put the you know, Canard's flag up. The idea is there's a great view from up there, and they see the ocean. So they see the ship coming into harbor before anyone else in the town does. So if you're a merchantman in the town, and you're going, well, is my cotton in today, or coffee, or whatever it happens to be, you look up at the pole, and it's gonna tell you if that ship's coming or not. Smaller mass for military communications, and like I said a little earlier, part of the Halifax Defense Complex, there's actually forts on George's Island, and there's forts uh, further out at the mouth of the harbor. The idea in the 1860s was for communication purposes, if you had one fort that could see another fort that could see another fort, using flags and other signals, you could send messages. Now this idea was meant to go from one fort to another, all the way from Halifax spanning to Montreal. That dream was never reached because then the telegraph was invented. It was a lot faster, a lot more effective uh, to send messages that way. Are there any questions?
in the late 1860s, like I said, you know, the front is the Americans. After the American Civil War, you have uh, Fenians, uh, so Irish regiments that were part of the Union Army actually invading uh, different parts of New Brunswick and uh, Quebec. And the idea was that if they could capture part of British North America, then they could exchange it for a free Ireland to get an independent Ireland out of the deal. That never happened. That was not from the Fenians anyways, uh, but it did mean that there was a very realistic possibility. There were a number of U.S. politicians uh, who wanted to uh, invade uh, Canada at this time and uh, make North America all a part of the Union. Now, I do talk a lot about the American threat, but I should qualify. By the First World War, the Americans are our allies. Canada is fighting in Europe, and Canada is supporting the war effort. Halifax itself was never attacked, never invaded, albeit uh, it was considered uh, during the American Revolution. George Washington sent spies up here. Uh, they measured the depth of the harbor. They looked at the defenses. They said, no, we're not going to attack. We'll attack Quebec City instead. And that's what they did. Um, the thing is, by the First World War, Halifax uh, was doing very well for itself. It always had soldiers and sailors here. Wartime was a happening time for this city. It meant the economy was doing really well. And then in December of 1917, the Halifax explosion took place. There was a munition ship full of high-grade explosives heading over to Western Europe. The ship was leaving the harbor, leaving the basin, and it struck another ship at about, nine o at about 8 o'clock in the morning. So these two ships collided. The ship with all the munitions caught on fire. About an hour later, the ship had drifted to the Halifax side of the harbor in the north end of the city, which is quite a ways down. It's in between the two bridges. If you get a chance to see the bridges, you probably just see the, the, the bridge closest to us, so just further past there. The ship collided, caught a fire, drifted to the Halifax side, and then exploded. And to give you a, an idea, I would just put it in context, this was the largest man-made explosion prior to the atomic bombs being dropped in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. This was a massive explosion. The anchor from this ship not only went from between the bridges, where it exploded, but it went over past the Citadel, and you can see um, past where your cruise ship is. So we went a huge distance, five hours north, you're going to be going to Sydney, Cape Breton, uh, if you're on the cruise ship there. Uh, China in Cape Breton, so people's China in their homes, the dishes, rattled from this explosion. Three and a half hours away, it could be heard in Prince Edward Island. It was absolutely massive. Now, within days, luckily for the railway system, of course, I, I should point out, over a thousand people died, thousands were injured, and then within a matter of days, they had insult to injury. Halifax experienced one of the worst snowstorms in its history. All the windows had been knocked out, any building that was still standing in the north end of the city, and even the south end of the city here, closer to where the cruise ships were, schools were made into morgues. It was absolutely dreadful. But in our hour of need, uh, and this is where you know I, I really have to uh, emphasize, in our hour of need, the Americans, the people of Boston, people of New England, sent aid, medical supplies, doctors, nurses on the train, and within a matter of days arrived here in Halifax to help the people in truly Halifax's darkest hour of need. And so it's a fine tradition that's still carried on to this day, the people of Halifax and Nova Scotia, to say thank you to the people of Boston, send a huge pine Christmas tree every December, and that's the city of Boston's Christmas tree every single year, out of our gratitude. And of course, nowadays, the Americans and Canadians are fighting alongside the Kandahar province in uh, southern Afghanistan. And they truly are our, uh, our neighbors to the south and our brethren. And, uh, you know, like all good families, we get along 95% of the time. Uh, <laughs> so the, uh, the, the Citadel itself, like I said, it was never attacked, but it was a very vital asset to Halifax. It's part of a greater defense complex, um, but it truly is uh, something which we've tried to keep. Uh, we restored it to the 1860s, uh, like I said, because this is when Canada was created and it's a very interesting time in our past. Um, all the ships, uh, just kind of add on to the First World War bit, all the ships, especially in the Second World War, the majority of them, the convoys, uh, they left Halifax Harbor and went across the Atlantic and uh, delivered the vital aid that was required for Great Britain. Uh, nowadays, Halifax is the home of the Royal Canadian Navy, a huge uh, port for merchant ships coming in and out. So we really are a city, and Nova Scotia in particular, with its fishing and everything else, we are a province that's built on the ocean. It is our life bread. It, it is what makes us who we are. So I'm going to take you uh, back down to where we started the tour.